Hey, you're busy, I'm busy, we all have a lot of stuff to do, so I'm going to whip through this. This is a, a recap of a presentation I gave on the 26th of October at the SF Cutters meeting about data storage and um, archiving. Now, really, there's, there's three words I want to talk about. There's archiving, backup, and storage. And technically, what I'm really, all I'm really talking about here is storage. Now, archiving means, actually, let's back up. Backup is making multiple copies of something so that if you have a catastrophic failure with one, you have another copy, preferably in a different location. Archiving is a little bit touchier. Archiving means I'm going to put this file away until I need it again. The real question is, how long do you want to have that accessible? Now, if you're dealing you know, with a great Hollywood film, you might want to be able to make sure that you have access to that 100 years from now. Um, if you're just doing some stupid, you know, crap freebie project for a friend, maybe you just need it for a couple of months, maybe you just need it for a couple of years. What I'm technically talking about here is storage. Um, now, if you have two copies of it, it's kind of backup, but I'm, I want to show you a really inexpensive way to store a whole lot of data. Now, um, you've probably seen my hashtag on the Twitters, uh, the switch to Premiere Pro, and I just threw this in here practically, at, you know, kind of as a joke when I was doing the presentation, uh, at SF Cutters. Okay, so when it comes to dealing with data, you hear a lot of FUD, and FUD stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So if you're talking to people about what's the best way to store stuff, a lot of times people, they're not gonna tell you you have to do something a certain way, but they're gonna scare you into doing it that way. And honestly, I really believe that there's some dis Disgen uh, un ungenuous, disingenuous, dis disgenuousity. <laughs> uh, um, you got to look at the motivation of the people that are talking to you. Quite often, they're trying to sell you something, and um, a lot of people will tell you that, like for example, oh, you can't, you, you couldn't possibly store data on a hard drive for two years on a shelf. Um, uh, that's not entirely true. I mean, I'm, I do, I've done it. I've pulled data off of old drives that are eight and ten years old. So I'm just gonna say that. All right, now. If you're dealing with a Mac Pro, you have multiple ways of attaching data to that. Now, the top two in this list, FireWire and iSCSI, are basically built in. FireWire is your FireWire ports, and iSCSI is a new-ish, maybe, um, technology that basically uses the Ethernet port um, as a way to transfer data. Now, you can put an iSCSI device on a network and any computer on that network can have access to it. I believe it's pretty fast. I don't know all the details, but basically it's built into any Mac that has gigabit. Now, eSATA, Fiber Channel, and SAS all require that you put some sort of a third-party card inside one of your slots of your Mac Pro. Now, if you're dealing with an iMac, you really only have access to FireWire, but technically you also have iSCSI. And you can get eSATA if you go to Other World Computing, and they'll actually hot rod your iMac and put an eSATA port on the bottom right um, uh, lip of the iMac to give you the ability to plug an eSATA drive in. Now, basically then that leaves FireWire drives. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, FireWire drives, that's a bad idea. That's not a proper way of storing data. But... Frankly, let's face it, we're all doing it. Now, it doesn't matter who you talk to. You're going to find some people that hate these LC drives and some that love them. Some people that hate the GTEC drives and some people that love them. Um, that's understandable. But I really believe that quite often, a lot of the times, the people um, that have problems with a manufacturer or any hard drive, a lot of times it's because they really don't treat the drive well. I want to tell you a quick story. The, the LC drives. Those guys um, used to not even have a power switch on the back. Now, I want you to think about the typical way you plug in a hard drive. You pick it up. You pick up the power cable. You plug it in. You got to kind of spin it. And it was like, ah, I got to line this up. Boom, plug it in. Now, the way that Lassies worked is they did not actually spin until you attached the FireWire port. So now you take the FireWire cable and you go, uh, oh, it's upside down. Okay, flick. Boom, you plug it in. Once you plug in the FireWire port, those things used to start to spin. Now, what's the next thing you do? Well, you put it on the table, and then you want to slide it back between, you know, the other drives. And that thing's got rubber feet on the bottom. Now, what do those rubber feet do on a wooden desk? They skip. They go da 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 da
spinning up a drive is one of the most delicate moments of the drive. You don't want to be vibrating it, shaking it, kicking it, anything like that. As a matter of fact, I don't even put hard drives on the same surface that my speakers are on. Like in an edit suite, if my if the if the if the speakers aren't mounted on the wall and they're like on the, each end of the console, you, I put my hard drives on a sidecar, on a separate table. Anyway, um, here's an important analogy. Um, I heard somebody say once that the, the way a hard drive head, this is from airliners.net, and this is a real uh, beach, by the way, in I think it's St. Martin uh, in the um, Caribbean. But the way a hard drive skims over the, the surface of, uh, excuse me, the head skims over the surface of the drive is basically like imagine flying a 747 50 feet off the ocean in 100 foot swells. Not easy to do. Okay. So um, this is uh, th this is a great image. You know, d you got to keep you got to keep in mind what you're doing when you're reading data off of a drive, especially when you're first booting them up. Now, my system won't work if you're not a if you're afraid to touch these. This is the mechanism inside the hard drive. It's also important to remember that anytime you're talking about a hard drive, you're actually talking about three separate things. There's the drive itself. There is the bridge board, and that is the connection, but from the outside world, firewire cable into the data on the drive. That's the bridge board. And then you also have the power supply. Quite often when a quote unquote drive dies, it's not the drive that's dying. Quite often it, it's like a bridge board that's burned out or maybe even a power supply that's gone bad. If you look at the specs on the drive itself, the mean, twi mean time between failure is enormous. And frankly, the drive very seldom really dies. So keep in mind that quite often you can tear a, a, like one of those lessees apart, pull the mechanism out, put it in a different enclosure, and recover all your data. So this is the top of the drive. This is the bottom of the drive. And um, this is actually a SATA drive. And you could tell on the left-hand side when you see those little golden uh, blades. Now those are different than the old pins we used to have on IDE drives. And the pins were very bendy, like it was very easy to screw those up. But these blades allow us to do the system that I'm going to talk about here. Now, what do you need to use my system? Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to buy some OEM hard drives. Now, this is what a hard drive looks like when you take the top cover off, and we never do that. But OEM hard drive means that you're buying just the drive. If you go down to your typical electronic supply shop, like a Fry's or something like that, and you buy a, a drive off the shelf, you're going to get a colored box. You open it up, there's an instruction manual. Uh, it's a hard drive. What kind of instructions do I need? You're going to get a ribbon cable to attach data. You're going to get a power cable to attach power. You're going to get a CD full of software you're never going to use. And then you're going to get all the packing material. The first thing you do is you throw all that crap out, except for, of course, the drive. Now, I, I'm no crazy greenie, but it doesn't take a genius to realize it's dumb to buy stuff and then just immediately throw it out. So when you buy OEM hard drives, and if you follow the link on this page here, you'll see it'll take you to Amazon where you'll get just a plain brown cardboard box, the drive, simple, simple packing material, that's it. So you're going to buy uh, OEM hard drives. The next thing you're going to get is this. This is called a Trailless drive bay, and it's made by WeebyTech.com. Now, WeebyTech is really cool because this, the way this thing works, is it's not like your typical removable drive of of olden times, back in the little house of the prairie days, where you'd open up the door and you'd pull the the little sled out. And you know, if you owned four sleds, any on any given day, you needed five, and you're always like wrenching on these things and undoing screws and putting a new drive on. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. But these trailless drive bays, made possible by those those gold blades on the end of the SATA drive, it allows you to just take a SATA uh, mechanism and slide it right in, just whoosh, boom. Okay, trailless drive bay, very cool. Now there's other different uh, different versions of this. Uh, there's a couple of things, people call them toasters, where it's it's a thing that sits on your desk and it has a slot and you just drop the thing and it's just gravity that, that keeps it in there. I like the drive bay because frankly you can stack stuff on it and I just feel safer with the drive. 